All right. Welcome, everybody, to the webinar, Three Ways to Lead Through Uncertainty. Uh, insights from Lauren Jones, Maurice Fuller, and Tom Erb. We're going to get started in a couple minutes, just let folks finish up their lunches, uh, grab something to eat, a cup of coffee, whatever it might be, um, as people are filtering in here and get started. Um, but while we're waiting, um, love to get some uh, involvement right away. Uh, if you want to drop in the chat, if you have any places you are heading on your next vacation this summer, um, or maybe where you just went over Memorial Day, things like that, that'd be great to hear. Um, my next trip is going to be over 4th of July. Uh, my wife and I are going to be going up to Banff in Canada. So we've heard amazing things about that. Um, get to kind of hang out up there for a few days, kid free. Um, so very, very pumped about that. But anybody else have on a panel have any vacations upcoming here shortly? Yes, I am going to Europe on uh, Saturday. Hey, that's right. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Is it Italy or? We are starting in Berry. <laughs> We're starting in Paris, um, which is where my family's from. And then uh, taking the train to Amsterdam, which is my youngest daughter just graduated from college. And this is sort of her graduation gift. Fantastic. Yeah. Sounds great. And I haven't taken a vacation since I've opened my firm, so I think I've earned it. <laughs> Love it. Tom Maurice, you guys just grinding grind away this summer? Are you taking any breaks? Oh, Maurice, I don't think we can hear you there, actually. I wouldn't say grinding away, but definitely some shorter breaks. Uh, some Some local trips for fishing and hiking and whatnot. Nice. nice. Yeah, I uh, <clears throat> we were in Gatlinburg a couple months ago, so that was fun. And um, uh, I have a work trip planned for later this June in Clearwater, Florida, and going to take the family and stay a few extra days. So nice. So that'll be fun. Yeah, that's all we got planned right now. Woo! It's gonna be hot. Love well, it. there's a beach there. There's water. And there's <laughs> Cool. All the ingredients yes, it for will a be successful hot. vacation. That's right? right. That's right. All the ingredients for a successful vacation. That's that's right. Yes. Sand. Love it. All right. Well, uh, we've given it a couple of minutes here, so we're going to go ahead and get things kicked off. Um, we have most people joined in, so we'll get started. Uh, first of all, thanks for joining today. Uh, again, what we're going to be talking about during this webinar is three ways to lead through uncertainty with wonderful insights from Lauren Jones, Maurice Fuller, and Tom Herb. Now, before we actually get started, I want to do a few quick housekeeping items. Um, this webcast, of course, is going to be recorded. So we will go ahead and send that out to you here within the next, say, 48 hours or so. So please keep an eye out for that. Um, you're also going to notice that you're currently on mute, but don't worry. Uh, we want to make this as interactive as possible. So if you do have any questions, go ahead uh, throughout the webinar, drop them into the little Q&A section there found at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to go ahead and answer those throughout the presentation. Uh, if we're not able to get through all your questions, we will make sure to provide answers to you directly via email um, afterwards. Okay. Also, just a quick little plug for an upcoming webinar series that we're going to be hosting. Um, it's entitled Metrics That Matter, and it's a three-part series. Uh, the first is really going to be highlighting around how to take a proactive approach to manage your data, um, as that's really critical for being successful in today's staffing environment. The second one is around five key metrics to drive your automation strategy. Uh, and the third one is going to be how can you truly unlock and understand the power of your data? So uh, feel free right now to take your phones out. You can go ahead and scan that QR code on the screen um, and go ahead and register for one or maybe all three of those sessions that's going to be coming up there. And of course, we will also have the link in the chat feature uh, that you can sign up for later. Um, and then when you're done, put them back away so we can pay attention, right? <laughs> All right, enough of that. So on to our panelists. We have an amazing panel lined up for today. So we are so lucky to bring these three veterans of the staffing industry together that are very passionate about this topic and have almost 70 years combined experience in staffing. Uh, we're going to start off with Lauren Jones, who is a powerful voice in the staffing industry. She has expertise in recruitment technology, business operations, and change management, and is also a podcast co-host, author, and entrepreneur. So after decades as a technology-obsessed innovator, Lauren founded Leap Consulting Solutions uh, to advise recruiting companies how to be more efficient, successful, and, of course, more human. 
Lauren is really fueled by endless curiosity, deep commitment to helping others, and of course, Peloton rides. So welcome, Lauren, and thanks for being here. Up next on our star panel, we have Maurice Fuller. Now, Maurice is the founder of Staffing Tech, and he has more than 25 years of staffing experience and leadership in digital transformation. Uh, previously, Maurice was a VP at a large IT uh, staffing and consulting firm where he led projects for Microsoft, as well as internal growth and efficiency initiatives. Maurice has an MBA and MSEE degrees from NYIT and the University of Washington, respectfully. So welcome, Maurice, and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Joe. And finally, last but not least, I'd like to welcome my good friend, Tom Erb. Uh, with a staffing and recruiting span of over 25 years, Tom has really established himself as one of the industry's top subject matter experts. Uh, he is one of the most highly sought after national speakers and is also the author of Winning the Staffing Sales Game. He is former president of the Ohio Staffing and Service Association, uh, the Human Resources Association of Central Ohio, and is the chair of the National Association for Personal Services, or we also know it as NAPS, and of course the former chair and current member of ASA's Professional Managerial Section Council um, right now. And so Tom runs a busy desk, and thank you very much for being here today, Tom. All right, who's ready to get started? Well, we're going to do a really quick overview of where are we in this current economy, right? Mm -hmm. And we're going to do some insight into learning about companies that are successful coming out of an economic downturn and make sure we give you the tips and tricks to make sure you're one of those companies moving forward. As we know, right now is a challenging time, right? We have this downward trend in the market with a 16% year-over-year -year decline in staffing hours. So what does this mean for you? Well, this means that there's limited jobs available. It's making it critical to fill, it's, make, it's very critical to fill each one of those as you can. We're facing high inflation, which increases your costs. Interest rates are rising, making your financial decisions challenging. And really the only way to outcompete is to gain market share. But how, right? How do we prepare our business now in order to be successful later, regardless of what happens in the future? And what we're going to do is talk about different types of approaches that have been taken previously according to a Harvard Business Study Review. So what we saw from HBR is they did a study of 4,700 companies before, during, and after a downturn, and they really had some interesting insights. First of all, one out of five firms don't make it through a recession. Of those 80%, uh, excuse me, of those that do uh, survive, 80% actually don't make it back to the pre-recession growth rates for sales and profits. And the question you should be asking yourself is, why does this matter? Well, right now, what we're hearing is a lot of focus, firms are focused on, hey, we just want to get through this current economic environment um, and not necessarily make any decisions for the long term. But according to the HBR, only 9% of companies were successful post-recession. And firms that took a what we call progressive approach that we're going to talk about here in a minute really outperformed peers by at least 10% in sales and profit growth. So. How do firms that take this progressive strategy compare to firms that didn't? And essentially what we're going to do is take a look at the three different buckets that we have here on the screen. The first is going to be prevention and promotion. These two areas are where firms dramatically cut their cost, attempting to prepare for this reduction in profit. And others operated like they actually weren't even in a recession or economic downturn, ignoring the current climate. And in the middle there, we see what's called the pragmatic approach. These are the firms that were not really strategic in their approach, right? They kind of try to cut a little here, invest a little bit here, instead of seeing how it would all work together in the long run. So now let's take a look at the firms, as I alluded to earlier, that took the progressive approach. And they had the highest probability of actually being successful post-recession. So unlike the others, they look to adjust their operations permanently right now, so as to survive during this downturn and also stay closely connected to their customers, setting themselves up for growth as we come out of the downturn here in the future. So the question is, how can you take a progressive approach to minimize the negative impacts now during this economic uncertainty and also thrive when the market turns back up? And we want to do this by setting yourself up for both short and long-term success. And that's what these panelists are going to talk to you today about. As we saw in the HBR study, progressive firms are best positioned after the downturn. And the reason why is because you're minimizing the contraction of profits and sales 
by not having to rebuild from the ground up after the downturn, like many companies that dramatically cut costs, ignore the current economy, or just put temporary fixes in place. By positioning yourself now correctly during the slower economy time, think about your strategic investments in people, process, and technology to set yourself up for success in the future. So today, what we're going to be talking about are three pivotal pillars to focus on in order to lead your firm progressively through this uncertainty. And these pillars that we're going to chat about are optimization, connection, and innovation. And these pillars should really be at the top of your mind as we move through everything here going forward. So enough for me. Let's go ahead and kick this thing off. Stop my share. And I'm going to lead us off with the first question for Tom. So Tom, you know, given today's current environment, what advice would you give to firms who are, you know, maybe feeling a little stuck between a rock and a hard place of not really knowing what to do? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Joe. Um, first of all, I love that. I love the slide about the the progressive and and pragmatic and you know the the progressive to me is what we called during the downturn in two thousand eight two thousand nine. Our mantra was, we're not participating in a downturn. And that's what the progressives do. There's enough out there that I can take from others. Because when you're looking at those numbers, you've got people that are slowing down, they're hitting the brakes. Those are the people to take from, right? And so when there is a downturn, and I'm not convinced there's a downturn going on right now anyways, there's there's a whole ton of data that shows that we're not in a downturn. Um, but if we are, and if your business in particular or your market or your, your industry or your vertical is in a slowdown, your competitors are slowing down even more. And when you ask, you know, what's the biggest mistake that people do is companies do exactly what their competitors want them to do. And that's what you always need to be thinking about is, is this what my competitor wants me to do? Because cutting staff, stopping hiring, stop selling, stop recruiting, coming up with a bunch of excuses uh, of, of why I can't continue to grow, just kind of self-defeating talk is exactly what they want to do. So to me, we're in this overcorrection, if anything. Uh, we're already seeing signs of coming out of that overcorrection. We're seeing job, um, job openings go back up, unemployment going down. We're seeing inflation going down. We're seeing all sorts of good things. So we need to be hitting the gas right now. Uh, the good companies are going to be doing that. Mm -hmm. Agree a hundred percent, Tom. Um, I, I think the, the most frustrating thing in a time like this is the stagnation, um, getting stuck in uh, making a decision to take no action is still making a decision. And, and I think that's where uh, some firms get a little bit lost is the choice of inaction is still a choice that can and is oftentimes detrimental to an organization. So, you know, sitting and writing it out, and we saw a lot of that in Q1, kind of shoving your hands in your pockets, going everything's on hold. And um, that is still a, a very deliberate decision in not investing back in the business. Now, look, I'm all for Safety first, <laughs> understanding what you're walking into. However, we in this particular industry tend to draw things out a little bit, whether it's an RFP or a buying, what have you, we, we tend to draw these things out and oftentimes make them more complicated than they need to be. Yeah, I, I agree with both, with both of you. Um, there's an expression that you never want to let a good crisis uh, go to waste. And so same thing is true with... Um, with economic uh, changes and fluctuations. Um, twice in the 2000-ish time period and 2008 period, when I was directly involved in a large staffing firm, we used this as an opportunity to capture market share. So when, by doubling down and seeing competitors uh, sort of fall off, we were able to come out of that time period in a, in a much, much better place. And, and our growth accelerated as a result afterwards. So I think the, the message here is that these, these cycles fluctuate. The situation that we're, we're in will change, um, most likely uh, for the better sooner than, than most of us expect. The demographics of our industry are such that uh, we can expect a significant labor shortage 
beginning in the second half of this this decade. We want to get prepared for that. So we want to capture market share and get prepared for accelerating growth the second half of this decade. Great. Those are all those, yeah, those are all great points. And if we think about, you know, how the industry used to be and the structure of how your businesses were set up, say, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, you know, they may look the same, but growth and technology have changed obviously a ton in the last, you know, recent amount of years here. So, you know, recruiters are they're they're doing the same job, but they're doing it differently. And if, and if you're not adjusting that, right, there's this this consistent need to improve, right? Because mm -hmm. the yeah. status quo is always changing. It's right. consistently changing. And the firms that are consistently doing this are the ones that are going to come out winning on, you know, on the other side. I think there are two key words there, right? It's it's adaptation and agility and and adapting to the environment, remaining agile. Um, mm. Those are the things that will carry you through times like this. But when we don't adapt quickly, um, and, you know, to our surroundings, to to the speed of technology, right? We are slow adopters of technology anyways. We're slow mm. buyers of technology. And with as fast as it's moving, that we have to adapt. We have to get mm. faster at making these choices and doing those things. And we have to remain agile so that we can still remain competitive. It sounds complicated, but again, adaptation and agility, if you keep those as kind of core values, you know, th those are things that will carry you through. Mm -hmm. This is this is perfect. So on that note, let's let's transition here. Let's talk about process. Mm -hmm. Okay. So LJ or Lauren, can, can you maybe keep going here? You know, what should people be doing? to optimize their existing processes. Love to hear from you first and then maybe Maurice on that. Oh my gosh. Um, well, we have, I talked about this at Engage, you know, at first, understand who you are, right? Start with the mission, vision, and values and wrap everything that you do, inclusive of technology and process around who you want to be in the experiences you want to create. Remembering you have three customers in this whole thing, your candidates, your clients, and your internal colleagues. It's really important. And then it's about looking at a uh, process. Um, you know, are your process, take take inventory first, right? So oftentimes we've got firms at the end of last year, we had five firms come to us and say, we want to blow the whole thing up and, you know, start over again and, and do the whole, you know, rigmarole. And that's disruptive to a firm. It's also costly. And when we go in and we look at process and we look at utilization and we take inventory, three out of five of those firms absolutely had enough technology. They did not need more technology. They needed to uh, learn how to grow, scale, leverage the technology, the existing technology that they have. That's all about reevaluating, um, taking inventory, reevaluating process, ensuring that it is aligned and documentation of those processes. This is another a foundational item. Um, if you are in a slower period of time, this is now time. Take inventory. Look at your processes. Mm -hmm. Flow them out. Get familiar with Figma or Lucid Charts, and, or hire somebody like us um, to come in and help you map out these workflows. Why? When we have clarity of what our process, our desired process is, we have agility that really allow us to to move around. And then when you're done looking at process, let's look at your data. That is the key to agility. Is think of it like a, a moving your house, right? When you have the bathroom items in the bathroom and you box up the things and you write bathroom on it, right? But let, let me tell you, I moved, uh, uh, I moved uh, in 12 days, our house closed in 12 days and we threw 15 years of stuff in a box, in some boxes. And I think we had 25 that were not labeled, right? That's dirty data. Nobody knew where to put them. We didn't know what was in them. <laughs> we didn't know where they were supposed to go. And so that understanding your data, where it should be, where you want it to go, is the key to remaining agile and, again, remaining um, competitive. And, and, and so if you've got, you know, we've got the desired experience uh, honoring our mission, vision, and values, we've taken inventory, we know what our process is supposed to be, and we know what our data looks like, that is your recipe for Amazing technology cookies. Yeah, I uh, agree with all those points. Um, I think uh, with respect to documenting processes, there's there's a lot of different processes. Uh, so staffing firms have a surprisingly large amount of, of processes. So documenting a lot of processes within your staffing firm, I think, is imperative 
But if you don't have the time or the resources to document everything, focus in on your most important processes and specifically focusing in on those metrics that you really want to influence or uh, improve upon because it will make a difference within your business. So um, I think also getting back to documentation, I think building up that expertise um, within your organization to be able to document and Lauren mentioned a couple of tools, which I think are, are great tools for documenting, but there's other tools as well. But having a really good um, document of, of your company-wide processes is really foundational for being able to begin to optimizing. Um, but also having the insights and, and the, the, the dashboards and, and the metrics to be able to look at your business and how it's operating and be able to dissect the the key metrics that matter um, and will impact your financial results and being able to focus in on just a small handful of those metrics and begin optimizing those to drive real significant uh, financial results for your business, I think is is key to being able to work within uh, the framework of limited resources. Most mm -hmm. staffing firms, uh, that I work have limited resources, so we have to make choices. We can't optimize everything. So we want to we want to focus in on those metrics that matter, and and specifically also focusing in on those moments that matter that are are driving those um, business KPIs. Maurice, you just did a great job there. You just exact metrics that matter. Metrics that matter. <laughs> Secret plug there again for the webinar series, three parts coming up. So make sure if you didn't get this QR code earlier, go ahead and sign up in the link here below. Um, but that, that's a really great point. And I think, um, you know, Lauren, you know, we talked about how data is important and things like that and how we can, you know, help people to use the technology they have to scale their activities and processes. Can you maybe elaborate on that and things like the keyword automation or kind of ah, <laughs> one I, of your favorites, right? I know it, it is one of my favorites because it's, it's in a, it's an investment. I love what Marie said about metrics, right? And when, when we were flooded with big data, right? I, I think that we, it got a little convoluted and, and, and again, it's that keep it simple, keep it focused on the metrics that matter most. And if you look at what we do, we, we in, inevitably sell time, right? If you break it down to the ridiculous, we sell time. And so any metric that will allow us to reduce the time it takes from view to apply or view to check or what have you, those are the, the metrics that we should be most focused on. And when you look at a tool like automation that will allow us to shrink the time that we get to engage. Um, we have a rule at LEAP, right? Automation on repetition, people on relationships. And when you can, when you have all of your processes, you know, aligned and organized and you understand what you want, it's very clear what pieces you can automate. What are, what is a repetitious task and, that we can automate and where we need to put focus on those relationships and connection. The whole purpose of connected recruiting and um, connected sales and people wanting to connect to something is so that we can let Leverage automation to do the things that we don't necessarily need to be spending our time or I want recruiters spending their time doing. Mm -hmm. and, and again, having them focus on the things that matter most, and that is quality and service. And, uh, and frankly, if you look at you know all of the data out there from a consumer perspective, remembering that our job seekers are also consumers, they want to connect to something they want and, and generations aside, um, you know, whether it's a millennial or a Gen Z or a baby boomer or a Gen Xer across the board. And Heather McGowan gave us data to, to back this up at, at Gig E uh, at the beginning of uh, or at, in early 2022, excuse me, the end of 2022 in September gave us the data that shows that people want connection in every meaningful interaction and automation automation can keep us visible and the people can help us shore that up with relationships and uh, automation and I'll, I'll say one more thing about automation it's not going to be your biggest investment but it it, it moves 
uh, endless metrics. You want to talk about metrics that automation can move. It can move margin. Be, um, it be, you know, if you if you simply apply automation, let's say in a redeployment scenario, so it can help you improve margin. It can help you improve time to fill. It can help improve uh, fill ratio, uh, quality of fill. So many metrics that one simple investment, when we have clarity of process and clarity of where to apply it, can move mountains. Yeah, I, I would just add one thing about process is that if you really boil it down, if you don't have processes in place, you're winging it. Mm -hmm. You're making stuff up as you go along. Your team is making stuff up. They're all doing things differently. And that's not the way to run a company. That's not the way. And it's not in the best interest of the company. It's not in the best interest of your employees. Because what I have found, and I'm a shiny object sales personality by nature, I need process. Process helps me. But you know who else needs process? Structured people, because they love process. Mm -hmm. Process benefits everybody. And so uh, the other thing that we hear too is that, oh, well, I'll get to that when things slow down. Well, now I'm hearing a lot of people saying things have slowed down, but they're not getting to it. So we need to, to nail down those processes. <clears throat> the other piece to it too is most of the technology that you that you use have best practice technology or processes in place. Mm -hmm. It's not like you have to make it up totally from scratch. You take what the technology you've chosen, take their best practices and processes, modify them a little bit if you want to, and now you have your process. And then the last thing I'll say about this, did I say I was going to say one thing? Um, <laughs> the last thing I would say about this is that, until the next thing, is uh, that process is only as good as implementation of those processes and the following of those processes. There's plenty of times when we create a process for something and it never gets used. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about it later and I go, well, I think we have a process around this. Well, but are we really doing it? So there, there's a lot of different pieces to it, but um, the, the, the good companies, the companies that are growing that progressive, uh, ah, uh -oh. Oh, we lost, we lost a lot of and fail through second. things like automation, oh, like Lauren talked about. Yeah. All right. We well, lost you for just a second, Tom. <laughs> all right. He's back. Good. Oh, I froze up. Yeah, you're good. Anything to add on that, Maurice? Yeah, I was just going to um, build on something that Lauren was saying, and she was talking about um, how to prioritize um, automation, which I think is extremely important to that we, because there's so many opportunities to opt automate uh, staffing firms. So uh, one, one uh, approach to consider is to do an inventory of how time is being used by recruiters and by um, sales execs. And so by looking at how we spend our time and analyzing it and building sort of an inventory of how time is is being used we can use that as a tool to decide uh, what automations that we should focus on and what areas of of these processes we should seek to optimize to gain time back so that we can spend more time with our candidates or spend more time with our our clients uh, to serve them better yeah that's a great point. And I think holistically speaking, going back to kind of wrap this section up of what Lauren was talking about with moving houses, right? And throwing all the bathroom crap into boxes and not knowing where it is, right? Data hygiene and health go a long way. So for examples, you know, businesses and even alluding to what Tom talked about, if not, hey, we don't have processes in place, everybody's kind of doing their own thing. You're limited with what you can do with say automation if your data is not good. And you know, good data hygiene equals, as she alluded, as Lauren talked about, you know, agility. So mm -hmm. we need to be able to have clean data because if you don't, you, we can't all of a sudden have actionable insights or things we can do to you know grow and have oper and understand the opportunities that we have to act for actual growth. So more specifically, you know, if we take a look at you know the good data hygiene and what we can do. Um, part of that is going to be setting up, okay, we have put this process in place and now we're, we're not going to have duplicate fields. We're not going to have duplicate data. We're going to have clean data moving forward. And what that all does though, it doesn't happen unless we have a good culture in place, right? And it starts with that. So let's move over to now kind of the culture sec section. Um, something like 87% of Americans have had at least some time working away from the office, right? 
um, to help improve their skills and in, in what they're doing. And as leaders, we need to be able to keep our employees motivated, right? And involved in the company culture. So um, this first question is for Maurice. Um, you know, when it comes to culture and fostering connections, can you lead us off with just talking about how important training is and, and even more so ongoing training uh, mm -hmm. with processes and technology in place? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. Um, so first of all, culture matters hugely. And, and as consultants, as we work with different companies, we see significant differences um, between uh, companies and, and the culture and uh, specifically around um, innovation, you you can you can we can tell when we're working with our, our different clients where innovation is really being encouraged with within the organization, um, and where it, it's not being encouraged. Um, and I and I think uh, that uh, that uh, that approach it really starts from the top down, where we uh, want to be innovative. We we want to move forward with our technology and, and the way we go to market. Now, getting to specifically to your question around training, I think training is incredibly important um, uh, in order to keep everybody to, at a very high level of capability. And even more so now, what, what I'm beginning to work with with some of my clients is proactively training in skills that need to be in place in order to enable the future of these staffing firms. So for example, um, right now, um, everybody is working with ChatGPT, but for the most part, it's limited to just a handful of, of people uh, within organizations. But once uh, ChatGPT is broadly rolled out within uh, Microsoft um, Office, um, it's uh, going to be a part of the future versions of Bullhorn as part of the co-pilot. Um, it's becoming an essential business skill like Excel or Word or Outlook. So I think we should recognize that and proactively prepare our staff for, for that type of technology so we can take advantage of it. So training and staying up to date on our ATS, our core um, uh, technologies that we use for uh, running our business, even newer technologies like we mentioned um, Lucidchart earlier, uh, training people to be able to use those kind of technologies so we can document processes using modern tools is imperative. Well, I'll, I'll jump in here. So on, so first, Maurice is right. It, it, it does start with culture. You need a culture of accountability. You need a, a culture of acceptance of change. Um, if you don't have a uh, um, Matt Fisher said something at Giggy two years ago, and it has stuck with me ever since. Digital marketing as a core competency will be the difference maker for businesses. And dare I say, I'll take it one step further and say digital marketing as a core competency internally and externally. Remember, your end users are consumers, and they're consuming um, information and learning things in different ways. <clears throat> and we are not honoring those, the, the, those things. People cannot sit down for 30 minutes anymore. I, we used to have uh, statistically concentrated learning time from 20 to 30 minutes, seven to nine minutes now. And yet we still have training content out there that is 30, 45, an hour long. And, and, and people just don't learn like that. There's a disconnect immediately. Um, and so, you know, ensuring that you're developing programs that are agile because technology is oftentimes I see firms coming in and they've create one training program, one and done. It's not an eighties. It's not an eighties hit. It's not a one hit wonder. It's not an 80s song. So I don't want to hit wonder. This is this is an ongoing commitment to um, continuing to scale your training. And oftentimes, when we see you know a, a more depressed market or we see um, things slowing down, um, what gets cut? Marketing and training. Um, it infuriates me because that, that's the time, that's the opportunity to get in front of your end users and create a culture of acceptance of change, get people excited about it, um, and really internally market, um, uh, you know, what's, what's happening uh, with the technology that you currently have within the organization, how you're growing and scaling with it, what the North Star is, how they maximize efficiency using that. There is so much rich information to be able to enable your end users with, whether it's a customer or a candidate 
or, or your recruiter and salespeople. Remember, your colleagues, you have three customers to, to train. And we do a really dismal job in training our clients to change. You know, how many different invoice types or how many different uh, time card methodologies are we accepting because we haven't trained our customers appropriately on new, more advanced ways of receiving time. Like that's just one example of how we don't do a great job of being trainers and consultants um, all, to all of our respective uh, audience members. And uh, so, yeah, you, you, you training is a lifelong commitment. Yeah, I think I um, <clears throat> agree with everything both of you said. Um, you know, there's different types of cultures. You started off talking about culture and there, there's culture around training and development. There's culture around technology. There's culture around accountability. There's cultural culture around just, you know, how, uh, what type of work environment you're in, work-life balance, all, all that kind of, kind of stuff. But if we talk about training in particular, uh, as an industry, we we do a pretty poor job of training people, even from the very beginning. It's usually sit there and watch how Sally works, and you know Sally picked it up from somebody else, uh, you know, before, uh, and you'll pass it along to somebody else, and um, yeah. You know, but then after that, it gets even worse. Ongoing training's even worse. And you know, Joe, from uh, from being in technology for a long time, most people know less than 10%, maybe less than 5% of what their applicant tracking system can even do. And that's the whole core of the technology. And um, so you know, there's two different ways that you can try and scale. It's either you keep adding people, which is getting increasingly difficult as we don't have enough people out there, not to mention it's inefficient, or we can keep improving the performance of the people that we have. And I always say, you got to work full time anyways, you might as well be good at it. You might as well keep getting better at it. Right. And yeah. so uh, it's more fulfilling. It's more of a profession when people get trained, it's more likely to lead to retention. It's more like, you know, it leads to, to more job satisfaction. And at the end of the day, it leads to more productivity, performance and results. So um, I don't think we we train nearly enough. Uh, <clears throat> part of it goes back to the previous discussion we had, which is we don't have the processes to train them on. Mm -hmm. And so we got to have those processes and then really train them. But uh, I'm a huge believer in it. I do agree with what Lauren said about uh, the attention spans and, and micro learning. We actually went from most of our online training was 45 to 60 minutes long. We've changed all of that to five to 10 minute uh, modules instead of, of large sessions, bro breaking up those large sessions. And it's probably still not short enough, probably needs to be shorter. <laughs> um, you know, I kind of compare it to that high intensity interval training where you're tricking your muscles all the time. That's the mm -hmm. best way to train people is to train them through different methods. Go and look at a, a five minute session, then apply it, then let's talk about it, then let's role play. Then, so we're doing all sorts of different things so that the mind stays active and absorbs as much of it as possible. Because if you just sit there and watch eight hours of videos or read manuals or just watch Susie there while she's working, uh, you're, you're not going to retain a fraction of what you need to. Now, I think that's a great point, Tom, because in, in our personal lives, right, we're scrolling through Instagram, we're going through TikTok. These are 10, 15 second clips that on our personal level, we're training our brains to respond to, right? And think about, and that's the, that's the difficulty that we're hearing, right? Is like, how can we foster the connection within our organizations when I'm combating this, like already kind of pre-built machine that I'm, I'm, you know, working with every day. And that's the example of like, if the culture isn't around continuous recruitment improvements mm -hmm. and, you know, how to get that set up, Unfortunately, some companies, as we know, are still in that set it and forget it man mindset, as you know, Lauren's 80 hit, 80s hits uh, reference was too, right? So these are all super important things that I think, you know, we could talk about. And I know that they'll preach till they're blue at the face, but like simple things as to, hey, business is slower now. Why don't we send out more NPS surveys? Let's hear what our customers are saying. Let's mm -hmm. see how we can improve our internal teams. And things along those lines to you know improve the culture and the morale um, within our organization itself. So 
wonderful talk track around kind of the middle section, which is connection. Um, to keep us on time here, I want to make sure that we, we keep moving forward. So let's move on to the third section, um, which is innovation, the fun one, right? Um, this is really going to be focused more around, you know, how can firms reframe and refocus or focus on an innovation in a climate like this? And it goes back to kind of what Tom led off with today, which was like WWYCD, you know, what would your competition do? What would they want you to do? And kind of do the opposite. So maybe Tom, you know, talk a little bit more about, you know, how firms can be thinking about innovation at a time like this. Yeah, it's always good to be thinking about what would your competition want you to do? Um, I heard a, a, a watch uh, Daniel Pink, who's an author and speaker, and he has these little 60 second snippets on TikTok now. And so I feel cool because I go on TikTok and watch Daniel Pink talk there. Um, maybe not the cool TikTok, uh, but uh, he had one that came out just uh, yesterday and he said, just think of, of nine words and I probably won't get this right, but basically what advice would you give your best friend? And, you know, think about that to be able to remove yourself a little bit. And when we start talking about innovation, it's, you know, what, what is it that, what is it that the future is looking like? What is it that we're, we're heading towards? Um, and as we talk about process, we need to integrate the technology into that process rather than have it sit on top or to the side or as an afterthought or whatever. So from an innovation standpoint, it needs to be you know, Maurice was talking about chat GPT. Educate yourself on those types of things. There's a lot of people who still don't know what chat GPT is and, and some of those other things. I'm constantly looking at what are the different AI tools out there, constantly trying to see what would apply. How can I integrate that into what I do and what my clients do? And that's, to me, that's the way to innovate is to be looking at that, not looking at it that We've done this the same way for 20 years and let's stick some te technology on top of it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And just so everybody knows, we do have an AI course on BARD, Copilot, and ChatGPT and how to apply it responsibly because remember it is still open source and we have PII to honor. Uh, we cannot walk into AI haphazardly. So that is just my PSA uh, for, <laughs> for AI. But I think we as an industry put a ton of pressure on ourselves to innovate. We don't want to throw money or people at the problem. And as opposed to understanding that innovation can come in different shapes and forms, like looking at your process and going, okay, if I sell time and I'm trying to reduce from view to check or from view to apply, what is that the most ideal process? Realigning that process, maybe even reconfiguring it with the existing technology that you have, that is still innovating. You do not have to go spend a quarter of a million dollars on technology to, to be considered an, an innovator. Being able to create a streamlined, frictionless experience is innovation in and of itself. And I think that, you know, we put a ton of pressure on ourselves um, to, you know, once again, buy all the things, you know, and, um, and I, I, I love all the tools. Look, I, that's what I do for a living. You know, we've done almost a demo a day since 2020. I love nothing more than looking at new innovative products, but understand that it doesn't have to come in the form of procuring something. It can come in the for, form of optimizing something. And optimization is a huge opportunity in a time like this. So I look at two entities within Bullhorn that don't get used uh, properly, like leads and opportunities. Um, and when I see that, it, it, it breaks my heart because there is so much CRM functionality within Bull, the Bullhorn CRM uh, side of, of the ATS and CRM. And there's so much rich functionality to be able to create great funnels and, and uh, predictive analytics and uh, scale your sales organization. And yet there are two entities that don't get used properly. And so during a time like this, when we're reevaluating process and you know innovating and optimizing your current system, again, is still innovation and in using it appropriately. So uh, you, you have a huge amount of opportunity um, during times like this to, you know, optimize. 
Yeah. So I'll, I, would, I would almost look at optimization and innovation, you know, synonymously in some cases. Yeah, all, all great points, uh, Tom and Lauren. I, I think um, the future of the staffing industry is really going to be built ar around uh, um, innovation. And I think that there's just so much opportunity to, to innovate. The, the challenge is, is where do we actually innovate? Because there's areas where we can innovate, but it doesn't have much impact. And there's areas where we can in, uh, innovate. And when we when we apply these ideas, the right ideas, we can make a significant improvement in the operations of the business. So I think it starts with being strategic in the areas where we want to innovate based on those metrics that matter and the moments that matter. Um, and what I have found is that when, when we talk to people, um, it's amazing the ideas that we can tease out of, of people within organizations um, that are that are really impactful. So when we have lots and lots of ideas to choose from, we need a way to evaluate those ideas. Um, so having sort of a mental model where we can take any sort of idea and, um, and imagine that that is implemented and think about the cost to implement um, and the impact that the idea is going to have and be able to do that for many, many, many ideas allows us to choose from lots of ideas and, and pick the ones that are likely to have the greatest impact. So, so in my own experience, too often when I'm, when I'm working with companies, there's a shortage of good ideas. And the value that we bring as consultants, we come in and we, we tease out a lot of high quality ideas and help identify the best ones to focus on to really meaningfully move the, um, the business uh, KPIs. So I would say being strategic, coming up with a lot of ideas, having the tools to evaluate the ideas and select the best ones. And then also fostering a culture of experimentation. When you look at companies like Amazon or even Starbucks, there's constant experimentation that's going on. And they're, they're prepared to see many of these experiments fail, but they fail quickly. They try things that they've evaluated and um, and out of that, some really, really amazing successes come out of that. So um, I think it's it's okay to experiment um, and to try things and see what works. I love that. And I think you speak right into something that is voice of the customer, right? So we, we get pretty obsessed when we're training or engaging or doing anything about data. We want to understand how did you feel after the training? What, what do you, what did, didn't you get? What did you love? What do you want more of? And voice of the customer, again, goes to all three customers and understanding what they want more of, what they want less of, how they want to engage with you. And all of that is by really, truly listening, creating a, a culture of um, you know, acceptance of all of these ideas. And, you know, you, you don't have to overcomplicate this. We do our surveys with, you know, Google Forms um, because it puts it in a beautiful little spreadsheet and we can track mm -hmm. all the data and, and, and all of that. So it doesn't need to be anything that is, you know, where, again, we're throwing money at some complex, you know, type of, of tool. Uh, but you can do a, a survey with Herefish and get beautiful data. Um, so it, again, it, it can be with tools that you currently have, but mm -hmm. getting that, you know, voice to the customer is an imperative. Agreed. And doing that on a regular basis. So it's yes. not just, you know, occasionally we do this. It's, it's just a built-in process where we capture, we capture, uh, the feedback from our customers and from all of our different stakeholders. Yeah. Yes. You should be looking at this regularly. Fantastic points um, on all those pieces. And to kind of, you know, wrap that section up around innovation, it, historically speaking, the staffing and recruiting industry, uh, we've been a little, uh, we'll use the term laggards when it comes to, um, you know, adopting technology. So these are the types of things that we can be doing. Um, real quick question that we had come in here that we'll try to address, you know, what are your favorite tools for process documentation? And we talked, Lauren talked about Figma and Lucidchart. Um, if there's other ones, obviously, you know, you can reach out to them specifically or they can have a one-on-one -on -one con conversation with them as well um, after the fact. So um, we have about 10 minutes left. So let's go ahead and kind of um, wrap up here with final comments and closing um, from each of our panelists. And again, thank you so much for your time today. Um, we'll go ahead and start with Tom. Um, you know, 
with all these things that we've talked about today, optimization, connection, innovation, uh, maybe can you share your final thoughts and maybe, you know, this is a lot of information that we've, we've thrown out today. Maybe give one thing that you suggest, you know, our attendees could take away from this webinar today, you know, in order to stay ahead of the competition we've talked about and not, you know, fight that urge as I've talked about is, you know, to hunker down um, and, and, you know, those types of things and make, you can do your little plug too of the best way to, uh, to get a hold of you. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I mean, if you're, you obviously, you always have to be fiscally diligent. You know, somebody asked Jamie Dimon, CEO of Chase, you know, is he preparing for a, a recession? And he says, I'm always preparing for a recession. So you, you can be fiscally diligent, but still be that, that progressive company and realize that there are always opportunities in adversity. And, you know, when things are going great, you get a lot of competition and everybody's doing well. It's kind of like the Tour de France when they're on flat land. Everybody's all bunched up. It's not until they go up the mountains that, that people start to pull away and the others fall off. And so if we are going through downturns or periods of, uh, of um, adversity, then we just need to push through that and realize that that's a real opportunity for us. The opportunity is not on the flat ground, the opportunities up in the mountains. And so <clears throat> I would just say that, that, that press on, uh, don't, uh, you know, don't be self-fulfilling when it comes to uh, any kind of adversity or, or thinking that things are slowing down. Um, because if you do, then you slow down and you're going to, it's self-fulfilling. It, it's going to happen. So I guess that's my one piece of advice uh, from today's call. Yes, I have a, a, a little story. I'll, I'll end with a little story. So we, we whitewater connect for years, right? Where your head goes is where your boat goes. Um, the lesson that I learned from that outside of staring at a big blackberry bush will make you look like Wolverine came after you, um, <laughs> is that where you put your focus is where you get your result. And if you're putting your focus on dismal results, that's what you're going to continue to get. If you're going to put your focus on how do we you know, continue to move forward, how do we continue to get results, sometimes it's getting back to basics. Sometimes, you know, we're doing a ton of um you know, uh, sales enablement. And uh, I, I, Tom, I know you're probably busy with all of these um, core trainings right now because they're, they're an essential part of continuing to scale an organization. But again, I'll say in our industry, we do tend to overcomplicate. And so understanding where you put your energy is where you're going to get your result and keeping things simple, understanding that innovation comes in many different shapes and forms. But if you stay true, to your mission, vision, and values as your North Star, it creates connection. All of the, it creates agility. It creates adaptation. All of these things come together when we give people something to connect to, leveraging technology to do so. So uh, where you put your energy is, where you put your, where you put your head is where your boat's going to go. All that. Yes. Right. Yeah. So Focusing on the right things, I think, is is super important. And right now, I think automation is one of the areas where we can really affect our futures positively. So it's one of the highest ROI investments that you can make as um, you know with your staffing firm. One of the interesting things that came out of Engage was was learning just that only nineteen percent of staffing firms are investing in automation right now. And those that are, are really, many are still at the very early stages of, of automating. So there's this another thing that came out, and that is that all staffing firms are seem to be uh, automating in different ways. So there's never been a better opportunity to invest in automation to gain efficiencies, but also to create competitive advantages for yourself and differentiate your firm from other firms. So if there's one piece of advice I would give, and that is to uh, double down on investments in automation and also getting back to the strategic part of, of automation, not automate all automations that we create are created equal. Some automations have massive impact and some have minor impact. So as we're, as we're pursuing our automation journey, we want to 
have lots of ideas that we can work with, but then selecting the ideas that are likely to have the greatest impact and prioritizing those um, ahead of others um, as we deploy automation. So um, that would be my final uh, piece of advice would be to double and triple down on investments in automation. Could not agree more. And that ties very nicely back into how I kicked the call off today. Those firms that are progressive in their thought process and how they're going to move forward with using tools like automation and repurposing their process, current processes and optimizing what they have and creating that connection within the culture of their business are the ones that are going to be coming out again. There are suggestions that maybe we're not in as big of an economic downturn as we thought. At the same time, we want to set you up for success moving forward. And that's really what the goal of the panel was today, is to give you some thoughts and ideas about how we can do that starting today moving forward. So um, we have a couple of minutes left here. Uh, we did have a couple of additional questions that were actually sent in on the side. Um, this one is really good because um, it's agnostic, and I, I think we need to address this. So if somebody wants to tackle the question of, you know, how do I know if my technology provider is keeping me ahead of the curve uh, in addressing these types of issues. Oh my goodness, roadmap. Oh, I mean, I'll jump in here. Roadmap alignment is huge. And that comes with meeting with your vendors regularly. Oftentimes I, I come into a situation, people have purchased Bullhorn or purchased ancillary marketplace tools and they met with them, they bought it, they implemented it. And then they're like, okay, bye. <laughs> and and roadmap alignment, ensuring that you uh, meet with your vendors quarterly, you understand what's on their roadmap. Um, we bought them because they're intelligent and they've got their finger on the pulse of the market. Uh, and in in ninety eight percent of the cases, uh, and and so we want to lean into our vendors to help educate us. But that means we have to regularly engage, monitor, manage, and have metrics that matter around your vendor's performance. So ask your vendor. I ask this of Bullhorn every day, all the time. What metric is this tool moving? And they always have an answer for me, which I appreciate. But if you have a vendor that doesn't have an answer for what metric they're going to move, caution flag should go up. And, and so, you know, roadmap alignment and vendor management will help you stay current um, with uh, innovation, if that's helpful. Great answer. Tom or uh, Maurice? I, I would just say, take a look and uh, does your software typically... Um, support what you're trying to do or limit what you're trying to do. Ooh, amen. And we see that with a lot of technology where you go, oh, it works, it works, it works. Oh, yeah, now this is where it doesn't work anymore. And you get you to the 75, 80%, and then it doesn't do what you want it to. And so I think in the simplest terms, just you know, are you constantly coming up against roadblocks with your technology or is your technology allowing you to do things you otherwise couldn't do? Yeah, that's a great point on the roadblocks. Is it is does the technology enable you to create the future for your staffing firm that you want to create? I think that's that's um, you know that's the core of it. is it a is it a platform that enables you to to move your business forward? And then the other thing I would I would mention on on software is having a plan for success and knowing what it's going to take to achieve success with any piece of software that, that you're likely to deploy. Um, I've had uh, companies that I've worked with that have had tremendous success in one context and then much less success in another context. So I think going in with, with a plan um, and talking with your vendor to understand what do I need to do on my end to ensure success with, with my software and using those insights to to get yourself off on onto a good start and then staying closely aligned with your vendor along the way as they evolve their product is going to help ensure continued success along the way. Perfect. Love it. And um, I appreciate you guys taking the time to join us today. Um, all of you have been fantastic and amazing. Um, I'm going to toss this back up here. So as we kind of finish up our call today, again, we're going to be sending out the recording um, within 48 hours of this webcast. And we really, really encourage you. I mean, you heard, heard how many times today they talked about metrics that matter, right? 
bring this QR code back up here, sign up for one, two, or all three of the sessions that are going to be coming up here shortly, because um, I think that's super important. There's also going to be a survey that pops up after the webinar. Please, please, please take 90 seconds and answer it. Um, this is what helps us, myself, Lauren, Maurice, Tom, help you. We want to know if, you know, what your main takeaways were from this, what you're going to be focusing on going forward, because this is going to help us you know, dictate future web webinars like this with panelists to give you the information you're looking for that maybe you can't find readily available on any website, but we need industry leading consultants to be able to talk with us about these types of things. So um, in short, how can we improve future webcasts that we can put on for you guys today? All right. With that said, we'll let, we'll finish right on time. We appreciate everybody being here today. Uh, again, my name is Joe Wirtz, National Account Executive with Bullhorn, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you, thank Joe. You. Thank you, Story. Thank you. thank you, Hannah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Maurice. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.